Good morning. Today, as we read through the Bible, we're in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. And in chapter 5, the writer is again establishing the supremacy of Jesus Christ, or the, the reality that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is, he is the appointed high priest by God, and not only an appointed high priest from the mortals, but he is the Son of God, appointed by God to come and to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And it, chapter 5 starts out, it says that every high priest chosen from among mortals. So, you I mean, people, the priests were chosen to be the high priest. And the high priest, I talked about the other day, would, would go behind the curtain in the temple to offer the, the sacrifice for the sins of the people. And um, it was a, quite an honor for this person to be selected as high priest that way. And one of the high priests that, that you would maybe remember is, is Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's father. He had been selected to be high priest, and he went behind the curtain in the temple to be the high priest to offer the sacrifice for the sins of the people. And not only for the sins of the people, but for the sins of himself as well, because he was immortal, because he was just as uh, subject to sin as, as anybody else. I mean, just because you're a priest doesn't make you any better than anybody else. Just because you're a pastor or a teacher or whatever. I mean, we are all the same when we're mortals. But the high priest was chosen, and it was, as I said, a, quite an honor to be chosen that way. But in offering the sacrifice for sin of the others, he also offered the sacrifice of sin for himself. And then, and then he talks about Jesus, and he says... And one doesn't take this honor, you know, you don't presume to take that honor. You don't just say, hey, I'm going to do it as a high priest. You're appointed by God. And then in verse 5, he says, So Christ did not glorify himself by becoming a high priest, but he was appointed by God himself. And there's a couple of quotations from Psalms. He says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And also, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek and the Levites were the, the priestly tribes. There were you know, 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of that way, and, and each tribe uh, or each son's descendants became a tribe of Israel. And the, the Levites were the ones that, that were appointed to be the priests, the, or the go-betweens between the others and God. And, and, and Melchizedek was uh, one of the great priests back in the, in the older, older days that way. So, you know, the, the writer of Hebrews is, is reminding us, pointing out to us that, that God himself appointed Jesus as this high priest. And not only that, but as God's son, he was sinless. He came and, and lived and died for you and me. And, you know, in verse 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And, and that makes me think of, you know, in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, that when he was tempted, I, I talk about this every once in a while, but Jesus was tempted to give in to Satan. And Jesus prayed, you know, if there is another way, if it be possible, let this, let this bypass me. Let, if it's possible, God, Father, you know, let this pass me by. But, however, not my will, but your will. Jesus was submissive to God in all things. And God heard this, this prayer of Jesus. And he heard the plea of Jesus from the cross. You know, when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus felt forsaken and left alone and abandoned. But within that 22nd Psalm that, that I just quoted the beginning of, there are the words that I read of the quotation here. You are my son, today I've begotten you. That's from Psalm 22. So as the psalm begins with this feeling of, of forgotten, for, uh, just abandoned and left alone, it turns into a, a, a psalm that, that acknowledges God, that recognizes God, that um, praises God and, and gives God thanks in some ways that way. So it was, but it was because Jesus was submissive to God and he is the son of God, came into this world and he lived a life for you and for me. And I've, I've got verses 8 and 9 underlined in my Bible. And it says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation 
for all who obey him. You know, he's the son of God, and he learned obedience to God, and he was submissive to God, and he gave himself to God, and he gave himself for you and for me. Why? So that we who obey Jesus, we who believe in Jesus, we who trust Jesus, may have eternal salvation. We may have eternal life. We may have the glories of a heavenly life with Jesus. I mean, you know, I, I often think about the heavenly splendors that Jesus left to come and to live on this earth as a human being. He left all of that glory and all of that power. I mean, he, he is, he is, as I said yesterday, you know, he's above the angels. He's, he's, he is God. You know, he is the top, top tier on, uh, on the chart of, of power and of might and of glory. And he gave all of that up and he came and he lived on earth and he was submissive and obedient to God. So again, these first, these first two-thirds of the chapter 5 remind us of the supremacy of God, the sonship of God, the sacrifice of, of the supremacy of Jesus, I'm sorry, and, and the sacrifice of Jesus for God on our behalf. And then, verse 11, he kind of turns the tables a little bit. He or she, whoever wrote this book, says, about this, we have much to say that's hard to explain. And my new revised standard says, you have become, become dull in understanding. The new international version says, you no longer try to understand. You've been, become dull in understanding. You know, and, and dull, you know, kind of a dimwit, kind of not paying attention. Uh, when a pencil is dull, you, you know, you can't really write very well with it. Or, you know, you, you don't get the job done as it should be. So, you know, so the writer is saying, you have become dull. You've become less apt to understand and to believe and to trust that Jesus came. And, and then he says, you know, you become dull or, you know, less willing to understand. And he says, by this time, you should be teachers. By this time, you have known and you have heard and you have, you have heard the glory of Jesus. You have heard the story of Jesus enough times that you should be steeped in it, that you should believe it, that you should trust it enough that you now are becoming teachers. And I think about that. First time I was asked to teach Sunday school or to teach confirmation or to preach. Ha! You know, I thought, whoa, no, no, no way, you know. But the reality is, is that as we are brought up in faith, we have that ability to share our faith. And granted, some of us aren't very good teachers. Um, some of us don't have the patience to teach, you know, first and second graders or preschoolers. And some of us, you know, it, it's just, it varies a lot on who we are that way. But, but this writer is saying that you have known about Jesus long enough that you shouldn't be questioning anymore, that you shouldn't be wondering anymore, that you shouldn't be wavering in your faith, you shouldn't be continuing to go back to the old sacrifices and being led astray by idols and, and, and letting Satan tempt you and take you away. You should be firm enough in your faith that you can teach others. And I think that when we become adults, um, adults within the church, you know, we have that ability to teach. And I think about as, as parents, you know, and as grandparents, um, we do. We, we model our faith to our kids and to our family. And um, yesterday we had my father-in-law's funeral and, and his, my sister-in-law posted that her dad taught her to love her Savior. And that's what we are to do. We are to be teachers of faith. Even if we don't teach within the church, even if we don't teach within the Sunday school, we are to live our lives. And that's what the writer is saying. You know, you should, you should be firm enough in your faith that others are seeing Christ in you and through you. You know, and he says, you shouldn't really need somebody to teach you the basic elements. No, you should know those. And then he says, you need milk, not solid food. You know, you're a baby, you're an infant. You know, you think about, you know, an infant. I mean, you can't feed them corn on the cob and mashed potatoes and gravy right away on the first day they're home. No, their, their systems can't do that. So they, you raise them on milk and then you gradually introduce them to the solid foods and the different, different delights of eating that way. And that's the way it is with faith. You know, you can't just be thrown into everything right away, but it's a, 
it often it's a gradual learning and that's why we have Sunday school we, we start you know in baptism and we we, we invite our children the youth to come to Sunday school and, and vacation Bible school and and confirmation where we teach them what it is to be a Christian and by the time in our Lutheran traditions that they become they, they come to this confirmation Sunday or the affirmation of their baptism they are adults and they have been eating the solid food. They've been hearing the solid theology of the cross, that Jesus died for you and for me. And then we ask them to profess that belief on their own and to promise to continue in that belief and in that trust in God. He closes, the writer closes this chapter with, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have faculties that have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. We do learn how to distinguish good from evil. Although oftentimes evil has a way of disguising itself. And sometimes evil can almost look good. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, and somebody will say, the devil made me do it. Well, I mean, that's really true. The devil is alive and, and well at, at work in the world. And, and so... We need to remember to discern between good and evil. And that's why we have this high priest, Jesus. Why he came to teach us about God. Why he came to write God's word in our hearts and in our minds. And to remind us that we are mature in our faith. And that we need to trust. Simply trust in Jesus. To to live our lives that way of you know, no, no more wandering around, no more wondering. Is, is there a God? Is there a Jesus? Am I good enough? Yes, you're good enough. No matter how bad you are, you're good enough for God. <laughs> and that's a great thing, isn't it? No matter how bad we are, we're good enough for God. Because God sent Jesus to be your high priest and my high priest. Tomorrow morning, I'll be leading worship from my house. Cheryl and I have both been in close contact with somebody that tested positive for COVID. So we're kind of in quarantine right now. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I'll be leading worship from, from our house, most likely from my kitchen table yesterday morning. Um, but I invite you to worship at nine o'clock with us. Have a great day.